I feel like I'm in Bulgaria. Well, there's nothing like knowing him. And uh, there is different degrees of knowing. My kids know me, my grandchildren know me. Guys at work know me, but my wife knows me the best. Paul says that I may know him. Press, I want only one thing I do. I go out and save souls. Paul says only one thing I do. That's good. Press on towards the mark for the high calling that's in, in God and Christ Jesus. So it's only one thing I do. You know, not two, not three. And he says that many of you uh, of uh, the mature have the same mindset. I was in Romania at a pastor's conference. I'm taking notes and everything. And, and the pastor said, this is Paul's number one main goal. Philippians 3.14. I said, preach it, brother. He said, Paul's number one main goal is to plant churches. I went, oh. And I'm not condemning him. A man can't give what he doesn't, have, hasn't had. But Paul says... Only one thing I press on towards the goal, the prize, is, is Christ. To know Him. To have His character. And then he says, by any means. By any, by any means? By any... I want to know you, the power, and fellowship of your sufferings. Partaking in all this, you know, all this he says there in Philippians 3. I want to know you by any means. Whatever you have to take me through, Lord, I want to know you. That's quite something, but, but that should be the goal for all of us to become like Christ. And I, I don't fault uh, you know, a lot of churches, but the main focus many times is doing. Doing. Let's go out and... I know every one of the Revelation churches, I know your works. I know your works. And works is important, but works, you are saved unto good works. You are the workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Keep the order. That many had left their first love, but it's all about a relationship, you and him. It's not about saving souls, even. <laughs> that's not, that's a false gospel. If I tell you, you're number one. I was at a church one time, he was a young pastor, I'm not condemning anybody, but he said, now go out this week and save some souls. Sorry, but that's not my focus. Go out this week and walk with the Lord, and keep your eyes on him, and if I be lifted up in your life, I'll draw the fish. Have you ever found out your plans don't work? I used to try to pounce on people and try to, you know. And I realized when I met some men of God who tweaked me, who, who got me going the right direction, and I, I couldn't swallow this right away. I remember I was walking with a guy at work. He was a teacher at the Bible school. And he said, Glenn, God is more interested in you becoming than anything you ever do. And I stopped him. I said, wait, wait a minute. You're telling me that God's more interested in you becoming than anything you do. And he said, yes. And I began to see this in the scriptures. I began to see it. Follow me and I'll make you to become fishers of men. Are you saying God's desire is not to save people? I did not say that. But John 17, you want to see an evangelism program? It opened up to me, John 17. Real clear. He laid out the, the plan there for evangelism. He says that, Jesus said that the Father and I may be in one, that you may be in one with us, that we may be perfect that the world may know. In other words, he's saying, he says, seek me, become like me, that the world may know. And the world's looking to see Jesus. Well, you need to get to my church. No, you take the church to them. They don't need the church, they need Jesus. You know, so it's, you know, you're the Bible and shoe leather. You're, you, your life. And we, we fell, we fell. But failure, I have failed over the years, but failure only failure if you quit. You keep going. Uh, my grandchildren learned how to walk by falling. I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to fail. But you don't stay in that. Though a righteous, this, this encouraged me one whole Bible school semester. Though a righteous man falls seven times, not a sinner, not a wicked person. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Wow. That gives me hope, Tim. <laughs> that gives me hope. So you keep building altars. Abram followed up. I'm glad God used imperfect people. Abraham, you ever do the same thing twice? He kept backpedaling, going down into Egypt, saying she's my sister. All these things. He kept moving out in the flesh, you know, with Hagar and all that. He kept listening to his wife and hearkening to her. But he kept building altars. 
he kept building altars and he kept putting a little bit more of his flesh on the altar. And he kept putting a little bit more of his flesh on the altar and he'd fail and, and then he'd repent and put, put more on his altar. He's repenting there, building altars. And God, he, he's following the Lord. He doesn't know where he's going. You're father of many nations. How many kids you got? None. And he's following the Lord. He's been led by God. And he's, he, he, he becomes Abraham. You know, he, he was converted along the way, changed, transformed. And that's the way the Lord uh, wants to do in our lives. He wants to convert us so we may strengthen other brothers. I was so encouraged. I got a message from Ruse uh, this week, and a pastor said, Thanks, and I'm, I'm boasting. You, you can boast. You know you're allowed to boast in the Lord. I'll boast in the Lord all day long. But boasting in yourself is evil. But you boast in the Lord all day long. This pastor, or this uh, lead in the church, he uh, messaged me and he says, I want to tell you thanks for not just giving a fluffy message. But you preached on trouble and you prepared me. Somebody says, why you talk about trouble a lot? You don't ask me. I'm just a newsboy. I, was, I delivered papers for years. Dog bit at my ankles. All that, my dog won't hurt you. I'm just a delivery boy. I didn't write the newspaper. You take the word tribulation, trouble out of this book. You have a little pamphlet. God talks a lot about trouble. Why? Because we find ourselves in trouble a lot. But we've got to know His ways. The children of Israel, God's people, knew His acts. But the Lord wants you and I to know His ways. See, we need converted in our thinking. Because if not, we, we think that evil's good and good's evil. We think that way. Our well went out this week. And I, I said, Lord, I, and I wasn't jumping all excited. It went out. The pump went out. You'd turn on the spigot. We're so take things for granted. Turn the spigot. No water. What's going on? You know, where to go? But at the same time, I'm aware that he's aware. And I said, Lord, thank you. You're going to work this out. Thank you. And I'm, I'm complaining less and less. You know, the pottery was putting a, a guy, a man of God, was watching a, a potter put put the pottery in and he asked the guy he says how do you know when it's done he said when it gives off a singing noise only known to the potter so we need to sing more in everything give thanks this is a will of God concerning you so don't murmur and complain uh, in everything don't murmur and complain the scripture says that you may be shining lights in this wicked perverse generation because everybody's complaining about the, boss, about the boss, you're not. Everybody's complaining about the government, you're not. Everybody complained about the pay cuts or whatever, you're not. You're sticking out like a healthy thumb. You're healthy. Please don't think salvation is just about going to heaven. He wants to put heaven in you before you get there. He wants to make you healthy. He wants to make you healthy and to know Him... He wants, that's his desire, but to come into sanctification and be holy as he is holy. From the Red Sea to the promised land, there's a wilderness to walk through, but they missed it. They missed it. Oh, it's easy to praise God when you're on a rooftop, or you, when you're, one of the first verses the Lord gave me, and I told you about the 10 or 11 things I'm still learning that he gave me. I shared overseas. I've learned a lot in the last three years. A lot. He's worked good in me. He's worked good in me. Jesus told his disciples, what I speak to you in the dark, I, I want you to, uh, what I tell you in the dark, I want you to speak in the day, and what I whisper in your ear, I want you to proclaim from the rooftops. And it sounds like when you're proclaiming from the rooftops, you're, so a sound, you're sounding it out. I'm telling you, trials have worked good in me. It's, it's, it, James has counted all joy, brethren, you go through many trials. What? And I've never been excited about going through a trial. Oh, I can't wait. But, but James has walked through the fire. And he's walking in the Lord in the fire. And you don't move out. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Christian, are you in the faith tonight? You can be a Christian and be out of the faith. You can be wandered from the faith in your heart. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. But many left their first love. How deceived we can be. Christians, whoa, it... Once saved, always saved, to save he heaven or hell. There's so much more life and death. This talks more about life and death than it does about heaven or hell. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So really to know Him, to know His ways, to know, his, to know Him, 
He has to take some impurities out of us. He has to bring the heat. You know, you take a, a kernel of wheat, when you put it in the ground, unless, unless a kernel of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it abides alone. And what it does it, in that kernel of wheat, the life is can, in, in that grain, it, the life source is inside the seed. But the problem is it's got a hard shell. It's got an exterior. Well, when that's put in the ground, you know, the warm temperatures, the germination, the humidity and everything, and, and, and it cracks, and it and out pops, and that comes life. You know, out pop, he has to crack our outward shell. He has to take us through some things, shatter us, says Gideon. How they won, the 300 men, they, you know, they had a, a trumpet in one hand, and they had a, 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 a pitcher in the other hand with a light inside it. Nobody could see the light, but when it was shattered, it, 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 it brought light and victory. Is shattered to all around them. But you know, this becoming. Why don't you see many people becoming like Christ? Well, if that's a Christian, wow, I don't want to be that. If that's what a Christian is, I believe because the majority of teaching out there is go and do. Go and do. And I'll tell you, so many more scriptures says about become. Become. Take heed to yourself. <laughs> you follow me. You follow me. We need to take heed to the scriptures. This week here, you know, I didn't. A guy come over, and I won't get into the detail, but he was uh, murmuring, complaining about somebody cutting trees and that. And I thought I saw him the next day, and I thought I could be a neutral. I knew both parties there, and I thought I'd enter into that situation there. Not a good move. First Thessalonians says, "Mind your own business, do your own work." You know, we like to mind other people's business. And I told, and I actually think the guy at the end of it, <laughs> the Lord, it was letting it blow up my face. I believe. Because I think he thought that I was on the other guy's side. I don't care. But the problem is, let me see. Uh, I'm going to read you from the Living Bible. I, I like that. My mother, growing up, I remember seeing that green Bible on her. I don't see too many people reading from it. It's called the Living Bible. The verse says in Thessalonians, This should be your ambition, to live a quiet life, minding your own business, doing your own work, just as we told you before, Paul's teaching. Then he says, and I thought it immediately of Proverbs 26, 17. Yanking a dog's ears is no more foolish than interfering in an argument that is not of your own business. Yanking on a, door, a dog's ears is the same of getting involved where you're not supposed to get involved. Glenn, mind your own business. You know, we like to, you know, my, you follow me. You know, we would do well to keep our eyes on the Lord and stay out of things, but you know, it's... The temptation, you know, to, to get involved in things, but but uh, be about his business. You know, and that uh, somebody mentioned our church on Sunday. I thought it was good. It says, do everything without arguing and complaining. I told you about my bag it was 31 days late. It was a mess. You know, some of my own doing. And I was at, I heard the word of church, and the whole the whole time the word was let it go, let it go. I wasn't letting it go. I wanted. Recompense. I wanted, you know, I wanted the money back. You know, I, I deserve this. In my heart, I'm saying this. You know, I, you know how we know how to act outwardly. But in my heart, I'm, I'm fighting. <laughs> Even on the way to the airport, I said, I'm fighting the Lord. And Brendan said, You're not fighting him. I said, I'm fighting the Lord in here. You can't see. We're covered with flesh. We even after church, I headed north <laughs> or south. Yeah, I headed Pittsburgh Airport. I got about two miles, and the Lord said, He started dealing me, and my wife started talking. <laughs> Let it go. Let it go. I, I, I'm arguing and complaining about my bag. What if we ever get parts in that and things? How do we handle ourselves? We argue and complaining in business? That ain't right. I'm, we're telling the guy on the other end of the phone and he, he's just working there. It says in everything, don't argue and complain. What are you after, Lord? You know this Christian life is impossible. Do you know that? I was talking about forgiveness at work one day and he said, I come out of the Bible study and one, one of my friends said, you know your teaching's impossible. And I think I shocked him. I said, you are exactly correct. You, it is impossible. But I said, with God, all things are possible. So I know that he's working in me. He's changing me. I can tell you. I testify. He's changing me. He's working in my heart. He's changing me. You can't see it. Maybe you can, but he's working in me. Making certain decisions recently that I, it's contrary to myself. You know, you have to battle yourself. You know, you have to be a warrior. David's looking for some mighty men. Back in the scriptures, the men of Zebulun, well-equipped. They weren't of a double mind. They were single-minded. You can't be double-minded, Christian. 
A double-minded man is not going to receive, or a woman is not going to receive anything from the Lord. You've got to be loving Him first, seeking Him first. Men of Zebulun, warriors. Caleb, he come out of battle the one time, and I, I read that. He come out after battle, and he says, the next, whoever takes that city over there, I'm going to give my daughter to. And I thought, wow, he flippantly say that, and I realized, no. What he's saying is Caleb's taken mountains in his 80s, and he, he's been a warrior fighting the good fight of faith. And he says, I want a warrior for my son-in-law. I'm going to battle. And may the Lord teach us how to battle. You know, he doesn't, the weapons of our warfare are not mighty. They're, they're not carnal. They're, they don't, God doesn't fight like we fight. You know, it's, if your enemy's hungry, you feed him. If your enemy's thirsty, you give him a drink. Well, that's the last thing I want to do. A guy in our church, his wife uh, ran off with, so to speak, an individual that uh, was another, of another color. And the story is of his own admission. He pulled in. Uh, it was a wintry day. And this guy, you'd have to know, he's got a great heart for the Lord. And he sees someone stuck. He's out in the country. He sees somebody stuck in his big snow drift. And he puts his boots on and he's running. All of a sudden he gets so far and he went, here it's his wife's boyfriend. And he turned around and he said, no way in the world I'm going to help him. <laughs> and the Lord said, go back and help him. He goes and helps him, gets out of there. That man ended up getting saved before he died. This gospel is, you've got to cut your head off. Get, lean not on your own understanding. You're either doing one or the other. You're trusting in the Lord with all your heart, or you're leaning on your own understanding. This is, you know, in, in, thank you for reminding me, Benjamin. Do you know that I, I, I said for years, oh, I got saved when I was 13. I got saved, but I didn't give him my life till I was 28. You can have a born-again experience and yet not give the Lord your life. You're withholding your life. You know what he's after? He's after your life. Not to take from you, to give you his life. Well, I'll give him a little part of my heart. Well, I'll give him this part. I want all of you. So he can give you all of himself. But he wants to make you, mold and shape you. You know, are you paying attention to what's going on in your heart? But he works all things together for good. From the Red Sea, like I said, to the Promised Land, there's a wilderness to walk through. And they, boy, they were praising the Lord. They, they got out, Miriam got the tambourines out, the horse and rider fell into the sea. Pray, oh, it's easy to praise God when he opens up the Red Sea for you. When you're on the mountaintop, see, I serve a God of the God of the hills and the valleys. And you've got to have a resolve, the hell or high water. I told you last week that the, uh, the Hebrew children challenged me. They challenged me. They said, oh, king, whether you deliver us or not deliver us, whether you heal my daughter or not heal my daughter, whether you get me out of this mess, give me a job, whatever it is, whether you deliver me or not, I'm serving you. I'm not bowing down this world system. I'm not bowing down this golden image. We are yours, Lord. We're lo yours. What a resolve. What a, it challenges me to, to keep going, to keep going. To no matter what happens, where's your eyes at? Where's your focus? Paul says, I reckon the suffering of whatever, whatever I'm going through is not worthy to be con compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. He's not talking about when he goes to heaven. He's talking about the suffering. You, know, you weigh it out and it's a bargain. You, know, you go into the store, oh, this, well, that, that's a bargain. Wow, that, that's a bargain. Well, sometimes he takes us through things and it may not look like a bargain. But I'm telling you, as you endure, as you can be a good soldier, you know, he says good soldiers, but there's poor soldiers. Are you a good soldier tonight? This week? If you fail, that's okay. Just confess your sins and keep moving. Keep walking with Him. I'll ask people, you still walk with the Lord? I get to church on Sunday. Didn't ask it. I told you I asked my boss at work. I said, how are you doing spiritually? Well, I'm teaching Sunday school class. And I didn't ask that. How are you doing spiritually? Well, our church, uh, our pastor just left. We're getting a new pastor. How are you doing spiritually? Well, I'm talk teaching Sunday school. I'm talking about the swaddling clothes around Christmas times. I said, no. How are you doing spiritually? One on one. I used to love playing my kids basketball. One on one. We always had a basketball hoop. One on one. This, although we're here corporately, we're here together. It's one on one. You know, it's a relationship with Him. That's that's what it's about. Knowing Him, knowing Him, and He He's got a desire that you know Him. But it's it's good that He needs to convert our thinking. Jesus tells Peter. 
fact, that's the message I sent back to him. I said, I will pray for you in Luke uh, 22, 31. Jesus is walking along. He says, hey, Peter. He said, you know, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you are converted, you'll strengthen your brother. So you walk this path, and you allow the Lord to convert you, change you along the way, and you're able to speak in other people's life and strengthen them. Strengthen others in the way. But he, the Lord, uh, it says, I, Satan is desired to sift you. That word desire means beg. Can I, can I have him? Can I have him? Well, maybe the Lord's thinking, well, you know, I've ministered to Peter for a while. Maybe I'll let someone else minister to him. Okay, Satan, you, you can minister to him. But Satan, I was talking to a Christian this week. How you doing? Well, the devil's working overtime on me. I hope you see God in everything. Now, if you're out making your own choices, don't blame God. Huh. Romans 8.28 is for every Christian, but it's not. It's for the Christian who's in the way. That's an anchor. That's a bedrock scripture. That I know that I'm in the way. Everything and anything comes in my way. God's going to work good in me. That's what he says. Because I'm loving him. Everything and anything. Even if it doesn't... See, sight throws us off. Even if it doesn't look right, doesn't make any sense, but I'm going to keep following him. It's an anchor. And we know all things, Paul says, all things work together is good. The disciples are on the storm and here comes Jesus. Jesus said they've been ministered to him for a couple years there. Here comes Jesus walking to him on a storm. They said, it's a ghost. It, it's, it's the devil. It, it's... How about it's God? You're, you know, darkness. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The second verse is the earth was dark, without void. It was empty. And the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the earth. And He said, let there be light. That's all one. Don't, that's, that, them, them verses are put in by the translator. That's all one. Darkness precedes light. Weeping for, endure, endure the weeping for night uh, enjoy in the morning. Darkness precedes light. So it's, you know, the Lord's trying to bring us into His life. But see, you know, narrow is the way, narrow, that word difficult is the way uh, that leads to life, and few there be that find it. So it's, well, I guess we can get started now. You know, there was a, uh, guy at work, he was close friends with a, uh, somebody that, he, like a father figure, this man was in his 70s without paint or whatever, fell four feet, I, I don't know whether he fell or he, whatever, maybe he had a stroke, but he passed away, and Joe said his wife immediately, and they had a nice house, they had cars and everything, and they, you know, and, and Joe came to work, and he said, you know, she said immediately, you know, all this stuff doesn't mean anything. We think that all this stuff means something, let them tell you you know, certain things and see how much value you place on that. But, you know, all that stuff, I thought of, uh, you, know, you know, life does not consist of the abundance of things. You know, the, the rich, you know, the Lord, he, he reads our thoughts. You know, that, that scripture Jesus telling about the rich farmer there, he says, he says, the man thought within himself. You know, he thought within himself, I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear these barns down. I'm going to build my good, my, my farm to take care. I'm going to eat, drink, and be married. I'm going to be set for the future. And the Lord said, you fool. And anybody else living this way is foolish. But be rich towards God. That's where, where riches are. I told a guy today, I mean, you know, he's, he's got all his ducks in order. He's a couple years from retirement. I know he's got a 401k that I don't even know how to pronounce the figures properly. <laughs> And that's all well and good, but I said, well, why do we give all of our life in this little scope of existence, 70 or 80 years, if maybe that maybe not even that, in eternities forever and forever and forever? But again, he wants you to become like him. But we have to obey him. Storms don't do it. Trials don't do, do it in and of themselves. You must keep walking in the fire as the Hebrew children. Keep walking. Many times we miss out on the hidden blessing that's behind the trials. Many times we miss out on the hidden blessing that's behind the trials. We can't see it. And like I said, James says, count it joy, brethren, when you go through various trials. 
because this works patience and you know all this and all the he, he's, he's writing this to Christians scattered about and going through trouble. Is he saying that? Is he what's he what's he thinking? Well, he's got the mind of the Lord, you know. But we need to see that, you know, what it, what God, what is God up to? He loves you too much to leave you the way you are. The world's finest china goes through the fire at least three times in the oven. And what that helps do is bring out the brightness, the gold, and the brightness of the colors. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. All I have is brokenness, Lord. And he's making something beautiful out of my life. And there's Jacob, the deceiver, the trickster. Oh, man, was he... <laughs> he was, he was, a, he was a, Deceitful man. We're all that nature. Do you know that? To the Lord converts us and changes us. We're all that nature there. And oh, he, he went through it. Cheated by Laban because he was, you know, the Lord had to take him through some things. He lo uh, lost his wife, Rachel, his love of his life. He worked hard for. You could say he lost Joseph because he thought he was dead, and then he lost Benjamin. I mean, that God restored all that, worked all that, but I mean, Jacob even even smacked him on the hip there, and he wrestled with God, and God broke his self-strength. See, God's got to break your outward shell. He's got to break your stubbornness, your self-love. He's got to break you from going your own way. He has to. He has to. Most Christians think, you know, they're trying to direct God. This is the way I should go. They're trying to direct God <laughs> without submitting to His Lordship and following His plan. Instead of submitting to Him and His ways, they're telling God. They're directing God. I see that in the Scripture. Uh, Philippians 2.21 says, All seek their own interest and not the interest of Jesus Christ. I preached this overseas one time too. I never saw that before. What's he saying there? Now that all, I don't believe all because Paul and Timothy weren't the all, but he's saying majority of Christians are about their own business first. My friend liked the book of Haggai there. He, he, uh, he was soaking it up there, the book of Haggai. God's people had started, laid the foundation, but they began to take care of their own paneled homes. Take care of their own paneled homes. You know, and God sends a prophet Prophets never won Man of the Year award, or never were up for you know, you know whatever. You know they came and they spoke the word of God, but the good thing is they responded. He said, you know you're you're at, you're wanting God to bless you. You're putting holes in your pocket, or you got holes in your pocket. You put money and it's falling through. And you know that your your ways don't don't uh, bring blessing. Your ways. You know what the Lord also showed me to share with you tonight. In the book of uh, Luke, it says, they planted, they married, they built it, they did this. In the days of Noah, in the days of Lot, the days of some man, what's the major sin there? They did it. Not one reference of homosexuality. And in Ezekiel, the Lord reminded me, they named the three major sins, uh, referring to Sodom and Gomorrah, and homosexuals not even there. Pride, abundance of riches, and I forget, well, you know, ease. Huh. The major sin is just we living for ourselves. Thank you, you've still been coming back. I can't believe it. We're preaching the gospel here. My brother's here. We're, we're all glorifying the Lord, and you're still coming back. So this is a true gospel. You want a false gospel? I'll tell you, okay, now go out this week, focus on saving. That's a false gospel. If, if, okay, if I come in today and I tell you this is uh, Monday, I'm a born again Christian teacher, you know. I tell you it's 20 below zero out. That's false. I, somehow we have this mindset false teachers are like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons and cults. That's true. But see, how many preach the true gospel? He wants your life. He wants your life. And he's going to work. He worked upon Jacob. He worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And God put a good work in him. He who began a good work in you wants to perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. I always thought, Tim, that was meaning going to heaven or the day he was coming back. No, 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 no. It talked about Philippians 1 here, about the fruits that are in Christ. So it's, uh, 
You know, he who began a good work in you wants to orchestrate it out, perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. David, he's in a trial. He's, he's out there on the run in the wilderness. Shimei, he's throwing stones, kicking dirt. And David, David's right hand man. If you're only seeing it from an earthly perspective, you're blaming the second cause. That's my co-worker. I can't stand it. My neighbor. Oh, that guy. You, that, that boss. That, that, you know. But David had, David went through some things and he had, he had vision. You know, my people are destroyed for lack of vision. That man over there from Rusay that I told you, he said, thanks for preparing me for trouble. Preparing you for trouble. Because it's not, if you go through trouble, it's when. It's scriptural. But so you, you know, I, I was playing basketball one time with my kids. They, I liked it when they went to halftime. I'd go out and shoot around and get the rebound and shoot around. Some little kid come up and I must have got a rebound from him. He's about eight years old and he, boom, he popped me in the stomach. And I, Brenda happened to be standing there and I, I was so shocked. I looked at this kid. I didn't even get mad at him. I looked and I said, what what'd you do that for? You took my ball. I wasn't ready for the hit. How much better though if you're ready for the hit? Go ahead, hit me now. You know, so preparation for storms. You prepare for storms back here, and so when you meet the winter storm, you're ready. You're prepared. There's a guy in our church, and he went to Viet through Vietnam, and he said, if I'd have got a chance to put a bullet in that drill instructor, I'd have did it. But I went through basic training. I went through the war successfully. Later on in life, I'd give him a hug. He saved my life. He saved my life. The Lord didn't save you to live the defeated life. He didn't save you to die along the way. He didn't save the children of Israel. I'll preach it sometime. Of, well, that's the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 10 says that they all went to the Red Sea. They all drank the same spiritual drink. They all did, all did. That's parallel to the Gospel, the New Testament. But they murmured, complained, oh, that's, that's not a major sin. You know, they tested, uh, tested Christ and they did all these sins, but then there's a sin name there. They murmured, complained. You know, Christians sometimes, we, we list sins. Well, that's a sin, that's a sin, but I can murmur and complain. The Lord wants you not to murmur and complain. And He wants you to cut it out of your life. He, cut, he wants to cut it out of you. And He's able to do that. He wants to lead you in all truth about yourself. So, I'm all over the place. It's shotgun blast. There it is. So it's, uh, so you know, as far as the Red Sea experience, they were on, they praised God and him. He was dancing and everybody, isn't it nice to dance around your rooftop? But a true testimony is someone dancing when they're in the fire and going through hell. That's the testimony of a Christian. That's the testimony of what's going on. You know, that, that's what's going on. It's easy to give them thanks when everything's going well. But you know, when, when you're in the fire and you're still giving them praise and thanks. When you're in the midnight hour, Paul and Silas are praising God in the midnight hour. They weren't in jail. They were in Him. And the Lord says, well... That sounds like home. And he comes in that place and a miracle takes place and chains are broken and prison doors are open up. He wants to free us from us. Break the chains, shatter everything. It's, it's binding us to this earth. It says, as they begin to sing and praise in the midnight hour, God heard them. He in inhabits the praise of His people. He dwells in praise. Where's God at? He ain't nowhere around me. Why, why is he taking me through this? Well, I'll tell you what, he's nowhere around you. Because he dwells in praise. And you know, he dwells in praise. But that's another thing, and that's another, you know, but keeping your hands raised. You know, we would do well to just, <laughs> in heaviness of days and time, we do get heavy. But Moses knew something. He took his brothers up with him. They held his arm up and the other arm up, and they held it all day long with when they held him up, there was victory. God's people experienced victory. This makes no sense, this gospel. It made no sense for, for Naaman to dip in that water seven times when it was filthy. You know, it makes no sense to seek his kingdom first. You've got to take care of yourself. I like when the silks first come to the church. I don't know who it was, but they got in their car, slammed the door, and one of them said to the other, We don't have to take care of ourselves anymore. God's going to take care of us. That ministered to me. God takes care of us. I remember being up in Pinecrest, and I, I have a habit sometimes, take care of yourself. You know, I saw some Romanian girl up there, I don't remember her name, Joe Fleet, and I was talking to her, I said, well, take care of yourself. And 
she looked at me <laughs> dead center. <laughs> Who was the teacher? Who was the student? You know, I can learn from anybody. She looked at me and she said, my God take care of me. <sighs> wow. That was spirit and life to me. You know, God can take care of you. He created you. He made you for a purpose. He can take care of you. He can take care of you through the wilderness, but Miriam didn't have any work done in her. You can praise the Lord all day long. Got the tambourine out, but three days later she's murmuring. She comes against Moses. You should have did this. She comes against the leadership. And they died along the wilderness. When they went to the uh, Rocky Mountains in the uh, gold rush days, they did good until they hit the Rocky Mountains. You know, they died in the climb. You know, so it's it's the wilderness is is a, is is a purpose for that. Get get this in mind, Christian. When you got saved, you don't get it on it fun for all. We we were out of fun for all. My adopted grandson, they had a birthday party. It was a fun for all. Game here, game here. It's a fun for all. It's not fun. The Christian life is takes work and effort, and there is a joy in it. Yes, but you continue to walk and continue to love Him. You know, there's, there's nothing like uh, him. Nothing like him. Well, I guess we better look at a few scriptures here. I had that syndrome though for a lot of years. You're first, Lord, after me. I've had Christians get mad at me. Do you know? Do you know that all Christians don't love the Lord? Or I should say this: Do all Christians love the Lord? I had this in Bible school and I learned you don't raise your hand real quick. You know, you guys have learned that too. The pastor had come out or the, one of the teachers come out and says, do all Christians love the Lord? And I thought, well, that's, in my mind, I'm thinking, that's a stupid question. He began to unfold the scriptures. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, it's he that loves me. Many get saved. I work at Pittsburgh Hangar. Many are saved. But I don't know how many are following you know, this is, a, this is a fight to the finish. Paul said, I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. You know, he was, he was not just the out here, but it's keeping your heart all the way. In pre-Olympic days, I remember, I thought I'd go into Varna. You know, we were going to stretch into Varna City in Bulgaria there. And there was women, I'm a little bit slow, but women about every 50 yards. I looked at after about the third one. I said, is this who I think it is? And they said, yes, it is. You know, they had prostitutes right along the side of the road. Very convenient for those. You know, so you're you're driving down here, and you know, along there, and I thought of the pre-Olympic days, where they had, you know, they would have runners there, and they'd have women strategically along the path there, and they'd have they'd throw gold bars if you could pick it up and you could run with it, you'd keep it. But they'd throw gold bars upon uh, along the path there, and the runner would pick them up and it weigh them down, and you know, get rid of the junk, throw off every weight that so easily entangles you, and the sin that so easily entangles you. It doesn't say sins, it says sin. One sin. I had a Bible school teacher said, there's only one major sin. And I said, boy, I want to hear this. Only one major sin. The sin of not loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Throw off every weight. It didn't say there were sins. Throw off every weight in the sin that so easily entangles you. First day, I remember going to fishing. Wasn't never much of a fisherman anyway, but you know, I always tangled my line. It's so easy to tangle your line. But this is a 24-7. Terry encouraged me one day, because in Bible school I said, I'll walk within my house with a perfect heart. Who sees me there? How spiritual do I have to be there? God sees you. He sees you in secret. He sees you when you lay your head. He sees you when you eat breakfast. He sees you when you walk to, you know, wherever you're going. He sees you when you cut the grass. By the way, Benjamin cut the grass. I got a couple pictures yesterday. Ha <laughs> ha! The first time he cut grass. Oh, I'm, I'm catching that. The blessing of having him in my home. I talked about the gift of hospitality to him. I think I've only heard one message on the gift of hospitality. It's right along line in leaders in the church. Gifted to teach. Gifted, given the hospitality. Huh. Well, it's not that important. Well, I don't feel like giving it. There's people who come to your home who won't come to your church. Mike's hospitality here, opening up the church on Saturdays, you know, feeding people. You don't have to give a full course meal, have them over, have popcorn or whatever. Does your welcome mat mean welcome? And I don't mean doing this in the flesh, just, just ordering, just, I'm talking about as the Lord leads you. And all the way through the Bible, 
says, offer hospitality without grumbling. Oh, here comes that neighbor again. <laughs> without grumbling, without gonging, that word. You know, the gong show years ago. Do it without gonging. Jesus said to Peter, Satan has desired to sift you, but I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. He didn't say, I rebuke him. He didn't say, I'm going to take the storm away from you. He loves you too much for that. He wants to develop you in the storm. That's, he wants to develop you in the storm. That's how he delivers you. He develops you. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. The Lord's interested in develop you in, in the situation. That's what he's after. Okay, let me, let me read a couple. Uh, Isaiah 54. We're going to close here in a little bit. Psalm 34, 19 says, Many are the affliction of the righteous. Many, not few, many. So are we seeing, Lord, even the prophet Balaam didn't see God working in the situation, even the donkey. I'll be, I'll be polite tonight and I'll say donkey. The donkey saw God's hand in the situation and the prophet didn't see it. Oh, it's, it's the devil, it's, it's the Satan, it's, it's the enemy's coming. No, no, it's God. It's the Lord. Isaiah 54, 11, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted. Behold, I will lay stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. I will make thy windows of a gates. He, he's building something here. Windows, foundations, stones. I will make thy windows of a gates, and thy gates of garbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stone. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. In verse 14, don't miss this. In righteousness you shall be established. And what I see there, in staying right. In staying right. And I have to just cut things, you know, stay right. In righteousness you'll be established. Staying right. Stay green, as Pastor Leah from Bulgaria says. Stay green. Stay green. I know what he was saying. He was saying, don't stop. Stay green. Keep walking. Keep walking. So who wants to hear, see this? This school. This is God's school of affliction. Who wants, who wants this? Well, God knows you can withstand. I wrote this down. God knows that you can withstand your trial or else He wouldn't have, have given it to you. He knows you can withstand His trial or He wouldn't have given it to you. His trust is in you. That explains the trials of your life no matter how severe they are. He has trust in you. Corinthians says He won't take you through anything that He hasn't put in you ahead of time. That's my translation. You know. No temptation, no trial has taken you by surprise. But He'll make a way of escape. He'll put something in you to get you through. There's times that we didn't even know if we could, we even despaired even life. My wife, looked, you know, her, we didn't have the strength for each other. But we didn't, you know, we needed His strength. The Lord is working all these things for good. He's driving you to Jesus. Suffering is a sheepdog barking at your feet, driving you to Jesus. And when you get there, it's like, wow. I talked to a guy also at work this week. I was telling him about uh, what I've been teaching. He says, well, I, uh, he's in my carpool. I like carpools. He can't go anywhere. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? He can't go anywhere. Um, bear with me. But there's, uh, his, his father was uh, a pilot. And... Uh, he met a flight attendant, left five kids, and went off. And through that, the mother, broken hearted, turned to Christ, turned to a neighbor who was a Christian, and got saved. And a lot of family were saved. And I know Ron uh, grew up in a church singing, and that I know I don't think he'd mind me sharing that. But but uh, trouble, trouble is uh, is is beneficial. It it helps. Uh, it helps to get the impurities out. Like I said, that, that, that exterior of that wheat that goes into the ground there, that humidity, that, uh, that warm temperatures, helps to crack that outward man. He'll, sometimes over your lifetime, he'll bring sudden 
destruction to you. Trials or he'll maybe bring uh, day by day trials or little things here and there. Uh, but he's trying to crack your outward man so that the Christ in you comes forth. You know, Watchman Nee teaches about that. He talks about the outward man. Uh, we have this uh, uh, treasure in earth and vessel. Uh, so he, he has to crack the, the outward. God uses broken things. The woman had the, the box of alabaster ointment and it, it, until it was broken, there was no value there. It, it was perfumed in place. God uses broken things. You know, Jesus broke the bread and he fed many. The woman uh, uh, broke the seal on her only thing she had was oil. She was in a, a pickle. She had no money. She had debt she had to pay. She was a wife of her prophet. And she, she uh, obeyed the prophet. Uh, they went and got empty vessels and she broke the seal there. And, and she, it multiplied. God fed many. Jesus broken body. He has to break you of your own ambitions, your own goals, your own desires, your own will. He wants to break you to get you going His way. Because He loves you. He loves you. Brokenness. We went to Africa this past December. You know, we, you never know when you're on a mission trip. I, I told Ben, you never know what you're, what's coming up, who you're speaking to, what's going on, things change. Well, we went to this conference here, and on the way there, he said, oh, by the way, the conference is, the name of the conference is The Value of a Broken Vessel. And I said, oh... Very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, because see, as he sifts you, and he allows, a little, he allows the sifting process, you know, get the impurities out. That's not negative. Jesus didn't say, I, Satan desired you, and I rebuked him. Get away. He didn't say that. He said, I, I pray that your faith won't fail. Keep your eyes on me. Keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Our problem is we get scattered all over the place. I told you it's, uh, you know, I miss, I miss working at the airport and seeing all the, I'd go in the break room there and I'd see mother, father, and all these three or four uh, sib, uh, little kids waving at me and I'd go into the break room and I'd start waving. Everybody was waving back but little Johnny, he was about five years old and he's watching all the airplanes go by. He's, he's watching all the action. You know how in this world here, you've got to get your head out of the, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> Don't give yourself to this. I told you I was riding to work with a guy, and he said, did you know about the cracker plant? I said, I don't know anything about it. Don't you get it in that newspaper? No, I don't. He said, somebody, do you get this? And I said, no, I didn't hear anything about it. On the way, I said, on the way, my, my, my own mind said, you are strange. A good strange. A good strange. But remember now, birds peck at the sweetest fruit. And dogs bark at strangers. You know, if, if you were familiar, dog wouldn't bark at you. So you're going to get some barking, but that's okay. The Lord's with you. But keep your eyes on Him. He'll use all things. He'll use people to rub you the right way. You get anybody that just rubs you the right way? So I'm waving at everybody and all these, the family's waving. And, and my focus is the little guy. I want him to see me. And, he, and finally the parents catch wind of this and they... They, take, they go over and they go the little, they're trying to point me out and he's all, he's still all over the place. Finally they take his face and they go like this. And when he saw me, we stood there for about a couple minutes, seemed like five minutes waving, you know, I felt stupid. But that's okay. Let's be a fool for Jesus. You know, you're not, you're, you're going upstream. Everybody's coming downstream and you're going upstream. But even Christianity, the majority of people like a certain book, go the other way. I'm going to find me another book. I get some Christians mad at me. You know, not intended, but, but I'm leaking on them. The Lord's leaking on them. The Lord's winning them over. When I went on my last trip, they laid hands on me and prayed for me. One person still don't come up to the study too often when I'm there, but that's okay. You have to suffer. You have to long suffer. As a minister of the gospel, you have to long suffer. Suffer along with people. As the Lord suffers along with me. And I remember how, huh, I only have to remember how long he suffered along with me. And he helps give me patience and endurance and help for me and my kids. If I remember how my heart was and things I've done, and I'm not justifying them, it helps me be the better parent. You know, to realize what the Lord is. But he suffers along with me and he wants me to suffer along with them. And not agreeing with their sin, but... But he wants uh, you to be sifted so you can be converted, so you can strengthen others along the way. Let's go to First Peter.
two verses. First Peter five. I look forward to Friday nights. You can you can, you you don't have to believe that if you don't want to. Good to see my buddy Tim. We've had some good fellowship out there at the First Peter five ten. We all go through afflictions. Verse 9 says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplishing your brethren. There's nothing new under the sun. We, we all go through things. Verse 10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory, and that word glory in the New Testament also means character. The Mattel, I don't know whether they still make a, a, a toy or not, but when I was growing up, Mattel made toys. Well, the Lord's in the making process. He's after making saints. He's after making us holy. He's after putting His glory, His character in our lives. He is calling us into His eternal character by Jesus Christ, not in ourselves. We're co-working together with Him. After you have suffered a while, not before. Not before, but after you've suffered a while. And this is, this is while you're loving Him, while you're obeying Him. Not murmuring, complaining, not fighting God. Why me? Why me? God says, why not you? I love you too much. Why would you give this little speck of time, 70 or 80 years, when eternity is forever and forever? This is a proving ground for the next life. This life's not for this life. After you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. That's pretty nice. So as we endure, as we stay in Him, He makes you mature, establish, strengthen, settle you. You know, in the Bible it talks about desire of pure milk as babes. It talks about little children. It talks about young men. It talks about uh, fathers. You know, He wants to make you fathers and mothers. He wants to grow you up. Many times I say to my kids, grow up, grow up. The Lord's saying, you grow up. Don't be tossed around with every wind of doctrine. You know, when you preach this gospel, you're not going to get you're not going to get what I see droves of hundreds and hundreds of people, Mike, in the church. When you preach this, you know, because it's a death to self, the self life. I have one life; I'm going to live it to myself. Well, go ahead. The dead sees dead; it, it receives but doesn't give out. It nothing can live in it. It's dead. You want to live that life? Go ahead. Nothing there, nothingness. But I found great satisfaction in following Him. Is it easy? It has been hellish at times. But do you have a purposed heart? Do you have a resolve? Hell or high water, I'm following you, Lord. No matter what, I'm following you. Following you, a faithful man who can find. Many proclaim their own goodness. I'll follow you, Lord. I'll follow you. Let me go bury my father. Let me go and do this. And let me go do this. And you might think Jesus is mean here by saying, go and let the dead... Oh, no. Huh. We have the written word here, but he's looking into their hearts. <laughs> don't ever think, don't ever apologize for Jesus. Oh no, no, no. He's looking right into their heart. Oh, well, I'll follow you, but first let me do this. They, the Lord wasn't first. They had that syndrome that I had. You're first, Lord, after me. Well, I wouldn't tell them that with my mouth. But see, you tell them by your choices. So, do you want to be strengthened? Do you want to be matured? Do you want to be established unmovable Paul says nothing moves me <laughs> wow if I get a certain phone call I'm sure I can be moved but at one time I, 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 I bet you I was like this and then now I'm probably like this and I believe the Lord is working all things together as we walk this path to where we're we're just we're not moved no phone call I remember early in my early in our marriage Brenda would get a phone call and he'd rock you know rock us or whatever but but, you know, I, I, you know, we have to, without vision, the people perish. My people are destroyed for lack of knowing. My wife will say, Glenn, court vision, court vision. You know, to see the open man, see who's the mismatch underneath. See who, who's, who's uh, you know, to hit the pass with. God wants to give you court vision. You come here Friday night, you'll get court vision. Come here Sunday, you'll get court vision. To see beyond your circumstance. To see what God's after. It's not the devil. It's not this. But I'm talking to the Christian tonight who's living Romans 8.28 now. <laughs> if you're out making your own decisions there, if you're out making your own decisions, don't blame God. You, you blame yourself. But seeing God, you know, 
seeing him, seeing the first cause. I like that. And I said it before, and I, I don't apologize, but I don't say you should do this. If you smack a dog with a stick and the dog bites the stick, the dog would be wise to look at the owner of the stick. See, the stick's the second cause. The first cause is the owner. And all the way through the Bible, who put Jesus on the cross? The Roman soldiers, they, no, they didn't. It says God did in Acts. Who, who put Joseph in the, in, the, in the pit? Who sent him into slavery? Joseph's brothers. Well, that's a good answer, but that's not the correct answer. God did. I told you about my one granddaughter comes over to the house. Who made Mimi and Pappy? God did. Who made the, the beautiful day? God did. She's two years old. She was two years old. She said, God did. She saw God in everything. Joseph didn't see it at first. And don't, don't condemn yourself. Joseph didn't see it at first, but he saw it to the end. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Long before Romans 8.28 was written. David doesn't see Shimei. He says, God, God sent him. Oh, no. There's a hidden blessing in here. God's going to reward me for good. I'm, I'm enduring this trial here. It doesn't feel good. It's painful. Them rocks hurt. Them dust. But don't take his head off. God's going to reward me if, as I stay in the way. But don't depart from a living God. Don't die along the way. Stay in Him all the way. When the pressure's on, it's, it's easy to depart from a living God. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Staying in Him. Staying alive, that old song, the BG. Staying alive. I'll use that spiritually. Staying alive. Staying alive. Don't die along. The wages of sin is death. And we put that on a Bible track. That's for the unsaved. Well, that's written to Roman Christians. And that, that can relate there, but it, it, you know, read it in context. The payment for sin is death. Adam didn't die physically right away when he sinned. He died spiritually. Where are you, Adam? God wasn't asking for a physical, physical location. He's asking him to repent and get back in the way. So, you know, first cause or second cause. And all the way through the Bible, Jesus. I got, I got, power to, I got authority over you, Pilate says. The only authority which you have is what my Father's given you. Jesus saw everything from his Father, saying, All things come to me, I in no wise cast anything out. Jesus saw, he's in the garden there. Even when the enemies come, and Peter's, he's seeing the second cause. I don't, I don't blame him. He wasn't converted at that point, I don't believe. He took a sword out, and the Lord says, Peter, put that away. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father's given me? Jesus seeing God in everything, His Father. Oh, help us to live on higher ground. What's really going on from your viewpoint? To, li to, to live above the world. You know, that's with hind feet, you're living above the world and you're seeing uh, His view. Last scripture. Promise, last scripture. I've got to watch promise. But it's, it's, hold me to this, David. First Thessalonians three. First Thessalonians is three. We read last week through much tribulation you enter in the kingdom of God through much trouble. First Thessalonians three, Paul sends Timothy down there to see how they're doing spiritually, to see how they are concerning their faith. To establish them. I'm in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 2. He sends Timothy down there to see how they're doing spiritually. Are you still in the faith, Timothy? I, I, you know, Paul sent me down here concerning your faith, and you're still walking with the Lord. See, there's Christians that stop walking. Some people don't believe it. Read your Bible. Demas was a missionary. He stopped walking. He loved his present world. And I don't believe he was out carousing, doing some evil, wicked thing. I believe he just says, I'm, I'm not... I'm done. I'm going to love myself. I'm going to just maybe go to church here, local church here, and I'm, I'm done. You know, he just started loving this world more than he loved God. Verse 3, that no man, this is why I sent Timothy down here, that no man, no Christian should be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you beforehand that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means a tempter have tempted you, and her labor be in vain. So Paul sending them down 
who check out their faith, and he says, Timothy, check, you know, see if they're still in the faith, and remind them that you're called, you're appointed to these trials. You're appointed to them. You're called to them. It's the, it's it's big a big part of God's sanctification process. In this life, you're going to go through trouble. We're all going to go through it. But like, like Jesus, he was a forewarner also. He, he told his disciples, in this life, you're going to have trouble. But don't focus on the trouble. Focus on me. In me, you're going to have peace. I believe he wants every Christian to walk on water. Walking above circumstances, not under it. He's provided all we know uh, for godliness. And, you know, it's, it's a fight to the finish. And uh, so, where are you tonight? You know, where, where are you? I know you're here, but where's your heart at? You know, maybe the Lord is speaking to you, make some adjustments in some areas to let go of some things. You know, He isn't, doesn't want you to let go to take from you. Again, He wants to give, give you. He wants to give you the kingdom. He wants, you, he wants to give you keys of the kingdom so you can unlock certain things in your life. There's keys of the kingdom that He wants to unlock in our life. That we, we come into the quality of life.